Well, first of all, thank you so much for giving you uh, your time up for, for us here on uh, allaboutbodylanguage.com. I'm very grateful and very appreciative uh, of speaking to us. No problem. Fantastic. So I've got a couple of questions for you, if, um, if you don't mind. No, please go right ahead. Fantastic. The first one is all about you, your book um, with uh, Ms. Holiness Adali Lama. About, uh, the, are there any like similarities between uh, your research on emotions and, and his teachings on Buddhism? Are there any similarities there? Well, that's, of course, what we explored. And the book is really not a normal type of book. That is, it's not text. It's a conversation. Yeah. It's the actual conversation and dialogue between the two of us as we searched for new ground in understanding the nature of emotion. And Tibetan Buddhism uh, does not take for granted anything we do. Yes. And I don't take for granted anything they do. So it was a very interesting conversation. We spoke uh, at the time the book was published. We had uh, it covered 40 hours of conversation. Uh, since then, we've met for another 10 or 15 hours to continue the exploration. And we did come up with some new ideas that neither one of us had thought of previously. It was a very intense conversation. And the title of the book reflects one of those common grounds that the key to improving your emotional life is to introduce awareness, the sort of flashlight of consciousness, into the process of emotion. Now, emotions evolved for dealing with emergency situations like the saber-toothed tiger. Uh, the modern equivalent of that is the car on the freeway that's verging into your lane, where you have to suddenly, without thought, without the consciousness uh, of consideration, you have to respond, and sometimes in very complex ways, but all without thinking, all without considering. Now, that's great for emergency situations. It's not always so good for the kinds of emotional interactions we have with our uh, friends, our spouses, our children, or our clients, where sometimes we respond as if there is an emergency when there isn't. Yes. Some, and we don't, if we want to exercise choice about whether to engage and how to engage emotionally, we have to be aware of when an emotion is beginning to arise, or at least be aware when we start to act emotionally. Very often we're not. It isn't until afterwards that we realize we've just been in an emotional bout. I'm so frustrated with the telephone system at my office that in exasperation, I said to my uh, assistant, I'm bringing in a wire, wire clipper and I'm going to clip the wires of all the telephones. Well, of course, that's a stupid thing to say, but I was in the grip of an emotion and I wasn't even, I heard what I said, but I didn't realize or consider why I was saying it. Yes. Wow, fantastic. So in regards to your research on uh, facial expressions, what would you say has been the biggest significant development in this field since the, the 1960s? What would, you, what would you consider the next big development? Well, there really are two, and one led to the other. The first was settling the argument between Margaret Mead, who said that expressions are completely determined by culture so that a smile won't mean anything related to enjoyment in other cultures, only our own. Yeah. And Charles Darwin, who, uh, your countryman, who, who in 1872 wrote a brilliant book called The Expression of Emotion in Man and Animals, in which he asserted just the opposite. Yes. Now, neither one of them had evidence. And when I entered the fray in 1965, 66, I didn't really care who was right. I just wanted to see if I could settle the matter while there was still time to do so. Yes. And a crucial study... Uh, which I just narrowly was able to do before it became impossible to do such research, was to find a totally isolated people uh, who had never been exposed to outsiders or the media. And I found such people in the highlands of New Guinea, and I found that their emotional expressions 
were the same as you'd see anywhere else. Although there are different rules about the management of expression, the expression is the same for at least six and perhaps seven emotions are universal to our species, and four or five of them we can identify in other primates. So that was the first big uh, issue, and it sort of fit very well with the work that came a decade later showing the importance of understanding the brain in, in examining behavior. The second thing was that, that to develop a, a tool for actually measuring and describing anything the face can do. Up until uh, we published the Facial Action Coding System, FACS is the acronym, in 1978, there was no way to answer the question of how many different expressions can a human being make? Yeah. How many of them are relevant to emotion? Can I be absolutely certain that two people are making the same expression because it appears somewhat differently because of differences in their facial features. I mean, the face is primarily an identity signal system that allows us to tell one person from another. And so we each look different. Very rarely in life does someone come up to you and identify you by the wrong name because they think you're someone else. That may happen once in a lifetime. So we have very different facial features, but on those on that stage, the expressions, these universal expressions are played out, but appear slightly different because of differences in wrinkles, fatty deposits, skin color, mm -hmm. shape of the features, etc. And the facial action coding system allows for the first time precise description and measurement. And now there are hundreds of scientists around the world using the same tool uh, to measure facial movement. Yes. It's the equivalent of the microscope uh, to looking at uh, cells, what the facial action coding system allows you to do for the first time with the face. So those are the two big things, one in the 60s and one in the 70s, that really revolutionized not just our understanding of expression, but our understanding of emotion itself, because the face still is the best window we have on what's happening emotionally. Yes. So in regards to facial expressions, how long would you say the average person takes to become prolific in detecting micro expressions? Well, we've tested over 15,000 people in every walk of life. And 99% of them just don't see micro expressions. Micro expressions are the product of concealment. Yes. And they are very fast, about a 25th of a second. We developed a tool called the micro expression training tool, uh, which is on our website, which takes about an hour. And about 100,000 people to date have used that tool online and have learned how to see micro expressions. And once you can see them, uh, you've opened your eyes um, to what's being concealed from you and your ability to spot normal expressions is enormously increased. And most people find it fun. It's set up uh, really so that uh, it's easy to do and we have just are coming out with a new version of it that teaches you how to recognize micro expressions when you only have a profile view. Because yeah. if you're not conducting a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you very often in a conference only see the profile of someone. Uh, that's It's also relevant to surveillance. And it's a different set of skills to recognize these same emotions when you only have a profile view of the person. Yes. So in relation to your facial expression background, how important would you say was your uh, mentoring from Sylvan Tompkins throughout this? Was he, was he, would you consider him to be the most uh, prolific facial reader of all time? Well, of course, I don't. I never had the opportunity except in my dreams <laughs> to meet Charles Darwin. Yeah. So I could certainly say in the 20th century, I believe it was Tompkins who was most sensitive to and most interested in the face. And it was 
Sylvan Tompkins, who got me interested in the face because I was able, he was able to show me by using slow motion and stop motion uh, cameras that I had, he was able to show me some of the information in the face. And I thought, if Tompkins can see it, I should be able to develop a scientific tool so that anyone could measure what Tompkins was seeing. So he was, although he ins was the inspiration for the cross-cultural work, he certainly was eager to see me do that. He was a strong advocate of the Darwinian view. Um, the I, of course, when I started out, I didn't know whether he was right or whether he was wrong. I just knew I wanted to try to discover uh, what the facts were. But then when I decided to try to develop a tool, the facial action coding system, Sylvan told me it's so complex, you'll, you're going to get lost, you'll never succeed. And of course, he turned out to be wrong. We did succeed, and he was very pleased about that. His theory about how the face showed emotion, maybe I should put it differently, his theory about what triggers emotions has turned out not to be correct. But certainly when in the middle of 1960s, he was one of only two or three people in the world who thought it was more than a waste of time to look at facial expression. Mm -hmm. So is it true the story behind when um, I've heard little stories about him? He was able to read facially the facial expressions of uh, wanted criminals, and he was able to predict what kind of crim the crime they've been involved in. Is that true? Or I don't know whether it's true. I know he made that claim. Yes. But I was never able to get his cooperation to actually test that rigorously. Uh, it wouldn't be hard to test, but it's never been tested, and uh, Tompkins is no longer alive, mm -hmm. so we don't know whether that's possible. And uh, I have not, although I do a lot of work with law enforcement, I don't use mug shots. No. I think that they're likely, in my work, you have to see the expression, which is movement. You have to see the change in the face from one appearance to another, often in microseconds or sometimes in a couple of seconds. But without the movement, it's very hard to get precise measurement. Yes. So, so in relation to facial expressions and especially micro expressions, the, the TV show Lie to Me was extremely popular, not just here in Great Britain, but all over the world. And um, I, I saw your blog that you were writing in conjunction with every episode. Um, and you were talking about um, when the, the show engages in things like poetic license. Um, can you give us a couple of examples of where um, poetic license happened in the, in the show Lie to Me? Well, I reviewed every script three weeks before they shot it, yes. and I gave them feedback, and I often gave them video examples of how to have things performed, but they didn't always follow it, because sometimes the, the what they were saying they thought was just too sweet to give up. So yeah. in the very first show... Um, they make the remark that people lie. Uh, Dr. Lightman, the so-called scientist who is supposedly based on me, yes, is a, says that people lie 12 times uh, an hour. Uh, well, I told him that's we have no way to know how often people lie. Yeah. You can't ask people how often do you lie and expect they're going to, if they know, they're going to give you a truthful answer. Yeah. And of course, we're not always aware of when we are lying. Some lies become habitual. So unless you had a invisible cloak and you could follow people around, you don't know. the. But they were they knew it had no scientific basis, but they presented it as if it did. Another thing they did wrong in the very first show was to confuse surprise the reaction we have to something that's sudden yeah. and unexpected with the startle response, which is the reaction we have to a sudden and extremely loud noise, or it can also be brought about by uh, being touched 
from behind when you don't think there's anything behind you. And they look entirely different. Startle is a reflex, and I had published on it in 85. But they liked it, and they did it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was grist for my mill in writing my blog. I believe it's the only time in the history of television, entertainment television, in which a network allowed a critic to write a critique of every show, and, it, and they put it on their website every week. Uh, now, they did that not out of the goodness of their heart, although the creator of the show was very eager to have me do that. Yes. Uh, the reason Fox did it is because people, it drew its own audience and it increased their total audience. And what they were after, of course, as any commercial television uh, will be after is the ratings that they can sell to the advertisers. Yeah. But the problem with the show, although it did heighten people's awareness of deception, it made it seem too easy. And uh, I opened my commentaries very often with saying, I never solved a problem with so quickly and with as much certainty as Dr. Lightman does, but he only has 44 minutes. Uh, I, if you tell me I've only got 44 minutes, I'll tell you, go knock on someone else's door. <laughs> if the issue is uh, determining whether this is the perpetrator of a serious crime or a terrorist or an embezzler, if the consequences are very high, you want to be very careful. I tried to get them to do a show where the scientist makes a mistake and it has disastrous consequences. Yeah. And uh, because this isn't perfect. There are about, even when I have all the time I need, about 5 to 10% of the time, I have to say I can't tell whether the person's lying or telling the truth. It doesn't work on 100% of the people. Now, to work, have it work on 90% is quite good. It's a lot better than chance, but it isn't perfect. No. So in relation to that, was one of the characters loosely based around the, the Truth Wizards project? Was Rhea Torres um, depicted as being a Truth Wizard, being able to spot deception without any formal training? Is, is that where that character comes from? Yes, they knew about my research on what we called the Wizards of Detec Deception Detection. And there are a very small number of people who, without any special training, have that ability, and uh, um, we have written a little bit about them. Uh, the scientist who was working with me and uh, followed up on that project died before it was finished, so I don't know whether the findings will ever see the light of day. But yes, they based the Torres, that character, yes. on that part of my findings. Uh, the creator of the show, Sam Baum, uh, did his homework. He read everything I had written, and he must have spent four or five days talking to me and asking questions. And so before he wrote the first script, he was extremely well informed. Unfortunately, he left after the end of the first year, and the people who took over were just didn't weren't as well informed. And then the people in the third year, uh, knew even less. So, and that coincided with uh, Tim Roth, who played the scientist, deciding that he didn't like doing science. He didn't want to do any more science in the show. He just wanted it to be about his personality. Mm. And so the ratings went down and down because people no longer were learning anything yeah. from the show. So were you surprised that it was cancelled, or was that what you thought would happen without the science? That's what I thought would happen, and that's what I wanted to happen. Uh, okay. uh, it was still taking about a day a week, and I didn't see that it was having any real benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my critiques of the show in the third year was a one-liner, no science, no comment. Uh, that's yeah. all, all I needed to say. There was no science in it whatsoever. And Roth, although he is a fine actor, no question of it, um, he got more and more extreme in the type of person he portrayed and uh, I think less and less interesting to people.
Yeah, because he was depicting your role, wasn't he? So if he was uh, dumbing it down and not doing things correctly, that would obviously have an influence on you because he was be- like um, almost being your, a role model of yourself, wasn't he? So I can imagine that being quite difficult for you to watch the show plummet, really. Well, you know, in my contract with Fox, I specified that he had to be of a different nationality, a different religion. He couldn't be married. He couldn't have two children, and he had to have a different personality. Yeah. Now, he could still be a scientist who studied deception, but I really wanted his character to be very different than mine. Yeah. And he did many things, and I commented in some of my critiques, that I would never do. He often lied to people in order to try to discover the truth. And I think that that not only is ethically wrong, But the information you get when you lie to people can be very misleading, and it certainly closes the door once they discover what you've done. And the UK has better laws in this regard in the criminal justice world than the United States. In the United States, you can tell a suspect, we found the gun and your fingerprints are on it, when that's a total lie. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you better confess where you have a chance. In the UK, you cannot lie to a suspect. Much better system. We do work in with some of the uh, English law enforcement agencies, and I think your people are better trained than ours, and they operate under an ethically uh, better system than we do in the United States. Mm. But you have a centralized system so that if you make, if the there's a council of, uh, oh, I can't remember what the technical term for them, but each constables, I believe there are 12 constables in England, and if they agree about a change, that change is made in every uh, police agency throughout England. In the United States, they're all independent. If I get San Francisco police to make a change, that'll have no effect on Oakland. Each, in part because of our rebellion against central authority, against King George, each police force in the United States is completely independent of every other one. There's no centralization. And uh, so we have many different practices going on. Yeah. So so in regards to all, all this training, um, how can people learn more? Have you got any um, like deception skills or programs that you run throughout the country or here in the UK? Yes, we do. And the um, if they want to get the online training tools like to learn to write, recognize micro expression, they should go to my website, which is Paul Ekman, all one word, lowercase, P-A-U-L-E-K-M-A-N dot com. Mm. But if they want to get a workshop, uh, which is being offered uh, all over the UK, all over the English speaking world and now in uh, Europe as well, they should go to a different website called Paul Ekman International. And there they could find out where the classes are being offered and they could sign up uh, if they want to take one. The one on deception is four days. That's a lot of time, but it's a very serious attempt to get people to be as skilled as they possibly can be. And, uh, it's a it's quite a popular course, and not just for law enforcement. Uh, a lot of people in human relations in the corporate world who are making decisions about uh, hiring and promotion, people who are dealing with industrial espionage, people who are involved in negotiations, uh, people involved in sales, uh, are all interested in being able to separate truthfulness from deceit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what have you got planned for the rest of this year and next year, Dr. Eckman? What big things have you got coming up soon that we can you can talk to us about? Well, the big things, I put all of my time into developing new online training tools because that's the way I can reach so many more people around the world. So we have, in the middle of next month, there'll be a new website for pauleckman.com much cleaner looking, I think. There'll be a new version of the microexpression training tool that's much more user-friendly. There'll be the profile version, 
there'll be the expert version. And if instead of spending an hour, you want to spend up to three hours, you can try to get as good as you possibly can get in spotting micro expressions. Now we have another suite of tools uh, that called responding effectively to emotional expressions. Once you spot, suppose you've just told someone they didn't get a promotion and you spot a micro expression of anger. How should you respond to that? Well, that's what this online training tool teaches you with giving you alternative responses and feedback for each response. And there's a training for the workplace, for family life, and for the criminal justice world. And that's all new material. Uh, and there's nothing like it being offered anywhere else in the world. And it really offers people the next step. The first step is to recognize the emotion. But the next step is to determine and get skilled in how to respond to the emotion you've recognized. So those tools will all be online in the middle of September also. By the end of the year, we'll have one more online tool that's made for couples. Uh, allows them to better understand how they deal with disagreements and what gets them angry with each other. And uh, that's uh, a still new suite of tools that we're just working on the programming of right now. Wow, fantastic. So I've got one final question for you, Dr. Treckman. Uh, have you got any uh, new books coming up in the pipeline? What are you considering writing about next? Well, I am considering writing a book about the backstory of what it was like to live in the Stone Age culture in New Guinea in the middle 60s. Okay. Those don't exist anymore, and there aren't many people who had that opportunity, and there are a lot of adventures involved. All the findings from the science have been published, but nothing about what it was like for an individual to live in that kind of situation as I did. So that may be my next book. I'm also considering another book based on my recent discussions with the Dalai Lama about the nature of compassion. Yes. And um, so it's books take a lot of time. Uh, but I'm expecting by late fall I'll take some time out from developing online training tools to write another book because I like books. It's yeah. uh, something I really enjoy. Yeah. Dr. Eggman, it's been absolutely wonderful to talk to you. Um, I cannot be kept with David and I cannot thank you enough here on all about body uh, we, we will, um, without a doubt, promote all your, all your work and you're going to have a, a very special section on our page under the uh, body language pioneers. Uh, and you'll be sharing that section with uh, Charles Darwin and uh, Sir Francis Bacon as well. So you'll be held in good esteem on our page as well. Well, there's no, no better company than Darwin. So yeah. thank you very much. You're very welcome, sir. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Bye now.